So I mentioned in the email today that today's an important day. We're doing, we're going to be talking about the uh, the core of our faith today in the, in the Paschal mystery. Um, and it's not, not an exaggeration. It's the core of our faith. It's where our faith is centered upon. Um, so, so we always start with, off with prayer formation. So I'll um, lead off with that. So a while back we talked about liturgy of the word as a prayer. Um, and that was the first half of the mass. You guys remember that? Liturgy of the word. Okay. Um, so liturgy of the word was we have God, God's word proclaimed to us. Um, and and we would we would uh, we listen, and that, that's a prayer in of itself. It's the first half of the mass. Uh, the mass as a whole being the, being the central prayer of, of the Catholic faith. Um, and so, first half receiving God's word, and the second half um, almost as a response to God's word is is offering offering the word as a sacrifice. We call the second half of the Mass the liturgy. So again, it's a liturgy. If you remember what the word liturgy is, it's uh, rather than, than our prayer offered individually to God, it's the prayer of Christ that we're offering to God. Okay, so um, prayer of Christ. So liturgy of the Eucharist. And again, this word Eucharist, I know it's unfamiliar to you guys. You're going to keep hearing it over and over again because it's, um, it's, the, it's the sacrament. The, we, it's the sacrament of sacraments. Um, it's Jesus Christ present to us. Um, and it's going to pop up again and again and again. And when I say it, it, it just is referring to uh, the consecrated bread at Mass, the, the bread that's changed into the, to the body of Christ. Um, that's the Eucharist. So the liturgy of the Eucharist is where we, where we celebrate that, that mystery that's happening. Um, so the liturgy of the Eucharist uh, has three important parts. I guess I should refer to those before I... Yes. Okay, so first you have the, um, the offertory. So we can, just to put it in perspective, uh, we had our, our Old Testament reading, our sponsorial psalm, New Testament reading, gospel, and then we have had the, the creed and the petitions. And then we go into this next part, and the first one's the offertory. Okay, so if we're thinking of this as um, now a sacrifice, the, a prayer of a sacrifice, um, we hear the word, we offer the word, the word made flesh as a sacrifice. And so the offertory, um, if you You've been to Mass, you've, you've seen, before COVID, we haven't done it since COVID started, um, people bring up the bread, the host, and the wine from the back um, and present them to the priest to be offered. Um, now we have to have the servers bring them to the altar. Um, but that's the offertory. We're, we're bringing the bread and the wine, simple bread and wine. Um, in fact, the bread is unleavened. Um, the wine is always very simple, no, nothing added to it, it's just wine. Um, it's, it's being brought forward to be, um, to be changed, right? Um, but it's, it's gifts from what man's created um, and being brought to the altar of sacrifice. Um, and so offertory, um, we're, we're offering these. And, this is a, and so I, I use this as, as prayer formation because this moment of the Mass... No matter if you're Catholic or not Catholic, so even right now you should be, you can be doing this when you're at Mass, we're offering ourselves on that altar with the bread and the wine. That this is a moment where, um, so we're offering the Word made flesh, the Word made flesh, and we're offering a sacrifice. We're also offering ourselves with the Word made flesh, because we are flesh as well, right? Um, and so, Octory. Bread and wine represents us. Okay? And then we'll go into the Eucharistic prayer. That's the long part where we mentioned this at a, a class back in the inquiry. Um, this is the part where we're kneeling for most of the time. 
because this is the prayer where um, it's, it's long usually, and this is the prayer that um, eventually will consecrate the bread and the wine when the priest says this, okay? And so I'm just going to read you some things from the Eucharistic prayer. Uh, maybe you can catch. I want you to think about who we're talking to when these prayers are being read, okay? Who we're talking to. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Okay, there's one. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering. Okay, so those are a few. I was looking for a different one. The very first one I think gives the clue the most. Did anybody hear it? If you think about um, God and the three persons of the Trinity, which one did you hear there? Say it louder, Don. The Father. The Father. The Father. This is the one that's, that's unseen. The Father is the one that, that is in heaven that's unseen, only begotten. If you remember, um, we, well, I'll figure out how you Trinity, but the Father. Where are the other two? Son. Someone say it loud. Okay, Holy Spirit. All equal. Son comes forth from the Father. The Holy Spirit is that love between them. Okay, so the Father uh, is unbegotten, okay, um, uh, unseen. This is who we're offering the sacrifice to. And when we're praying these prayers at Mass, because the Word made flesh, the Son, He is the Word made flesh. He's the one that we're offering as a sacrifice. And so we're, we, He's the one that we see, that we, remember we pray with images, we, we, we see the Son, uh, we unite ourselves with Him, the offertory so that he's being offered to the father okay and so then um, let's, let's get one where it says really clearly make holy therefore these gifts bread and wine we pray ascending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Anybody um, catching what the Holy Spirit's doing there? You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. Okay, so um, this liturgy of the Eucharist, we're offering the Son as a sacrifice to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that is, is present, that, that, is, that is making it happen, that this bread and wine is being transformed by. Okay? Um, and so at, at every Mass, specifically Liturgy of the Eucharist, all three of our persons of the Trinity are present. They're all, all three are present. God is present. Okay. Um, and so the, the center of the Eucharistic prayer is when the priest uh, holds the bread and he's bowing down. And he says, take this all of you, eat of it. For this is my body. It should be given up for you. And um, I know you guys can't see it from a long ways, but you can see all, all the words in, this, in the book are regular type. And those words that I just read to you are, are all caps. Um, and so that's on purpose. So the priest um, has a certain sense of reverence as he's praying those prayers. Okay? Because um, these are the words that Christ spoke that makes the sacrifice happen. Um, okay, so this is all going to sound a little bit like foreign to you. And I'm, this is an introduction more so for what our topic is today. And so this is a prayer... And that is, it's the Mass, and it's the, 
Um, the um, greatest prayer that the church can offer is the prayer of Christ. Um, and we're going to go into it more deeply all through the class. If, so if, it's, if you're sounding kind of distant and foreign to you, that's okay. Okay. Um, okay, and the same with the chalice. Um, and then after the Eucharistic prayer, uh, the bread and the wine have been changed to the body and blood of Christ. And then the sacrifice is consumed. And so the last part of the liturgy of the Eucharist is the communion rite. Okay, um, which, God willing, you'll be able to partake in in a short few months okay, at Easter. Um, so I want to encourage you that these together make up the greatest prayer we can offer. We can, we can pray here. We always pray here. Um, prayers are relationship with God. Um, we, we always go to it because this is how we relate to God. Um, but the... Um, the most important prayer is the Mass, um, and I hope you guys are participating in it. Um, and I, we just made these new magnets uh, that we're going to hand out. If you're already a parishioner, like if your family goes here already, then you don't necessarily need one of these. Um, but yeah, if not, I want, I want you to take one, okay? Um, can you just come on the back there, Mike? So you can put it on your fridge as all of our Mass times. Okay, well, when we have Mass. Um, and so even as a ca candidate or as a catechumen, um, the fullness of participating in Mass, to pray the Mass, is, yeah, to receive communion, but to be able to hear God's Word and to be able to offer yourself on the altar, you can do that right now. And, 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 and you should be. Um, but this is how we're, we're always going to deeper conversion, um, is in this prayer of the Mass. And so, again, it's a vocal prayer in that we hear the words of the priest praying out of this book, um, we can make that our own prayer. Um, we we make, it, make it our own our own heart. Come with a humble disposition to where we're always being formed and allowing it to, to, um, to be us uh, up there on the altar being offered. Okay, does anybody have any questions on that? Um, okay, so I have a prayer for us to pray. We'll pray at the end where it'll make more sense to you after the lesson. Um, so I'm just going to lead us in a prayer. Uh, okay. In name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take a moment to uh, open our hearts, come humbly before the Lord. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for the gift of the Mass uh, as the supreme form of prayer that we can offer. Uh, we thank you for these candidates and catechumens and the desire you put upon their hearts uh, to enter into a deeper relationship with you, uh, to know you on a deeper level. Uh, we ask you to continue to bless them and their sponsors as they guide them. Uh, and on this journey, that they may not grow weary, they may uh, carry the cross well, um, they may continue to learn well, um, to pray well. Um, we ask you to uh, bless this class and our discussion, um, and that it all be offered um, to you through your Son, um, as all things are offered. We ask this, we pray, uh, through the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, who is uh, our mother, as she was the mother of your Son. Um, and so we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. I'm going to erase this. Hopefully you guys all got it if you want to take it down. Okay, so, Paschal Mystery. Um, let's just review a little bit of where we've been so far. Okay, so last week we had the person Jesus Christ uh, 
talked to us from Bishop Barron, a little bit from Mark, too. Um, and um, it was who Jesus is, uh, most importantly, that Jesus um, makes many I am statements all, all throughout, right? Uh, claiming to be God, that, that he's not just a human person, but that he's, that he's God, that he goes, goes beyond that. Okay, and so um, in our Bible, uh, the four Gospels are where we, where we learn about him as a person, that they, those are his story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, and they're just start of the New Testament. So traditionally, Jesus died at about 33 years old. That, that, that's, that's his kind of tradition. Um, and so but with that, it's thought to be the perfect age. I'm almost there, the three years more. Um, and so the majority of the Gospels um, are actually not his full life. But the um, majority of the Gospels are a little bit from his infancy. And then it's his last three years of his life. Um, which, which we called his public ministry. And even more of it uh, balloons at the end of the Gospels. Every Gospel has at least two chapters dedicated to the last three days of his life on earth. Okay? Um, so, if we're looking at a timeline here, I like to have it charted out. Okay, so, you have his infancy narratives. So let's all turn to Luke in our Bibles. So you guys can find it. It's the third gospel. So it's your third gold tab. Okay, so if we turn to um, Luke chapter 1. But verse, verse 26, everybody see that section? Let's name that section, Cody, but verse 26, you see that? Yeah, the birth of Jesus foretold. Right, yeah, the birth of Jesus foretold, okay. So, so this, this section um, is, we call the Annunciation. Fancy name, Annunciation. This is the beginning of Jesus' life on earth. Okay? Um, and so, this, this really you could, you could vouch for as uh, one of the most important scenes in Scripture. Um, where Angel Gabriel um, announces to, to Mary that she's going to bear a son, and then she set, gives her fiat which is our theme for stewardship this year in, in Wichita Diocese. Her, her, her yes, but more than a yes, her let be done to me according to your will. Okay, so this is the beginning of Jesus' life. And then you flip the page um, to chapter 3. And that's, that's it for Jesus' infancy narratives. We go right to Jesus as a full-grown man on chapter 3. That's all we get. And Luke is our, is our uh, the most of what we what we get for Jesus' infancy narratives. The rest of them don't do, even do less than that, right? Annunciation is not in any of the other gospels; it's only in Luke. Okay, um, and his birth is only in, in Matthew, besides Luke. Um, and so, this is the most. So, really, you start off with Jesus' baptism, or John the Baptist leading up to Jesus' baptism. Um, so. Go right on past this to Jesus's, let's call it his public ministry. Okay, begins with his baptism. Jordan River, okay, it's by John the Baptist. That's why John the Baptist is at the beginning of every um, every gospel. So you can see in Luke, it's right here at chapter 3, verse 21, and it's one of the key events because it's the beginning of his public ministry. Okay, and so um, public ministry is where Jesus was out preaching, right? He, he was out um, with calling his disciples, people who would follow him. He was performing miracles. Um, he was exercising demons. 
Um, and he was making the head Jews really mad. And that led to his passion narratives. Okay, so his public ministry is most is the majority of the Gospels, I would say. Um, but then his passion narratives are the last two chapters of every Gospel, except for John is like about half the Gospel. John's the last Gospel. Okay, so let's turn to Matthew. That's where we'll be at for a lot of today, I think. Matthew's the longest Gospel. To me, it's the fullest in some ways. Um... I think I like John the best to read and pray with, but Matthew is good for understanding the sto- understanding the story. Okay, so these are the three, I'd say, periods of Jesus' life that we have in the Bible, um, and we're we're working with this one today, the Passion narratives. Okay, uh, Passion coming from the the Latin word passio, which means suffering. Okay, um, and so we're working with his with his suffering narratives, you could say. Um, but it's, it's more than his suffering. It's also his glory at the end of his passion. Um, yeah. Okay, so passion narratives, um, last two Gospels. If, you're, if we're in Matthew, it starts on, verse, on, on chapter 26. Okay, so Matthew's the first Gospel. Chapter 26, the, head, or the heading of it is Conspiracy to Kill Jesus. A- and... Um, from there, it's, it's just heading towards his crucifixion. We say passion narratives referring to his crucifixion, his death, and his resurrection. Actually, that's not really a passion narrative. I should say this is the, the Paschal mystery, our topic for today. Um, let me step back for a second. The very fir- first class, we mentioned... Uh, I was talking about creation and the fall. We ended on kind of a bad note, okay? Because because at the fall, um, we were left in a place where uh, Adam and Eve took the fruit, disobeyed God. They uh, they grew. They lacked trust in God. Remember that they lacked trust in their father as a father that can provide for them, um, and so they they disobeyed. Um, and from that point, it create, we created, that was original sin. From that point, all of, of humanity received that sin uh, in our flesh, okay? Uh, we call it fallen nature, in our flesh. Um, to, so we have the natural distrust of who God is in our life from that sin. So, today we talk about the answer for that. The answer for the fall is the passion there is a paschal mystery, okay? I hope you can still see it. Paschal, P-A-S-C-H-L. And we call it a mystery because it is still a mystery. It's all in God's, God's plan. That's what's mysterious about it. It doesn't really make sense to the human, to the human mind. Uh, it's, it's a mystery in that sense. We can, we can come and understand to a certain point, uh, with reason, but to also at a certain point we need, we need our faith to really grasp how Jesus can uh, save us through this Paschal mystery. Okay, so I'll break out into into dis, uh, discussion groups here. Um, what if we have these four tables? Um, be with the Weddas. Um, these three tables. So right here, these three be with Kevin, and then these be with Mike, okay? And just pull your chairs, put your mask on, um, and, and uh, your question to, uh, to discuss together, why did Jesus die for our sins? So we're discussing basically that, this mystery. Why did Jesus die for our sins? Just kind of taking stabs at it, talking it out with each other. So pull your chairs up to, to make a circle with each other. We'll have a few minutes here to discuss.
Go ahead and wrap up your discussions and then come on back. Okay, it's a complicated question, that's why I kind of gave it to you guys to, for discussion, okay? Um, so 
So we, we ended on a problem that needed fixing, um, and this is the solution that, that um, is given to us. Uh, it is a death, okay? So at that original sin, when Adam and Eve uh, took the fruit, disobeyed God, it, it left us with God and mankind, and, and there's a chasm between us. Um, and so when um, a lot of you are married, okay, or if you're not married, you at least have, have friends or relationships. Um, in a human relationship, when something happens between us, uh, or we do something that affects the relationship, and maybe, you know, um, you know, you quit talking to each other for a little bit. When I was in high school, this, this is how high school uh, relationships work. Um, one of my best friends asked a girl I liked to, to prom, um, and that's when I quit talking to him for, for two months. Um, and so, anyway, those, those things happen, but you can always fix those. It's a human relationship, um, and the, the, the sin, the, the wrongdoing, Okay, it's on a human level, um, but when this sin against God happens, okay, um, because God, that that relationship was supernatural. It wasn't a natural relationship where th things are seen and, um, and done and um, on the material realm, but supernatural, um, and so it, it leaves a rift that is is not just fixable by you know making up, but it's infinite. Because God is infinite. Because God is an infinite being. There's, there's no limits to him. Um, and so, this gap is not just the average gap in a relationship, uh, but it's an infinite gap. And, and the gap was one of love. Right? Because Adam and Eve, what was the problem? They didn't love God enough to obey him in that, in that, in that instance. They believed the devil more, and their love for God was lost in that moment. Right? And so that there's an infinite lack of love in this gap of, of the in relationship. Um, and so, important word alert. Okay, Eucharist, uh, first important word. Second important word, if you don't already know it, incarnation. Okay, incarnation. Um, what's always helpful for me to remember what incarnation is, is that the Latin word for flesh is carne. You can see that here, um, and you have in. Okay, so this, this word's always referred to to refer to Jesus, um, God becoming man. Okay, so God taking flesh in the flesh. Okay, um, God taking flesh. Uh, so we learned this last time that when God took flesh, uh, He was still fully God. He wasn't just half God and half man. And, you know, the half of him that's God dies, and so the, oh, so the half of him that, that, that's man dies, so he's just God then. But no, he's fully God. He can't, he can't only be partially God. You're fully God, but he takes on flesh. He's born of a woman. He's fully man. He takes on her genes, right? And he's fully, fully man as well. Um, and so... Um, we hear his story in the Gospels, as I mentioned before. Um, the word gospel meaning good news, okay? That's where we get the word gospel from. Um, the good news is that God became a man, and this led to the, oops, led to the Paschal Mysteries. That God became a man, and that as a man, he died. And so this gap that we see, right, it's it's infinite gap, and it's, and it's on mankind to replace it, because mankind's the one to commit the sin. And so as a man, he's able to represent mankind, but as God, he's able to make an infinite sacrifice, because only God is infinite. And so in his cross, this is the picture that you, you see drawn all the time, Okay. In his cross that we see depicted so well in our church, right here, we're always reminded of whenever we see a cross. But that's where we have the, the gap finally, finally bridged. Um, is, is where a man, 
he's fully man, makes an infinite sacrifice as God as well. So we call this the Paschal Mystery, okay? The fact that this happens, that this bridge, this uh, infinite gap. Um, okay, so we're going to go back to the Old Testament for a little bit and look at where this came from. You know what? We'll go to this in a second. Let's watch the video first. This is part of our new setup that I keep, that I keep hyping up, so we don't turn the lights. The lights are off a little bit, but you can see it pretty well. Can you guys see it? Okay. Michael, what does the crucifixion of Jesus Christ reveal? You know, when you just think about this pure human level, when you think about a crucified man, uh, it's a really odd symbol of salvation. The real thing about it. The modern equivalent would be like depicting a man in the electric chair being electrocuted and holding this up as the symbol of our salvation. So the question is, what what does it reveal to us? Well, there's really two things, I think. First of all, I think that the crucified Savior reveals to us the real horror and ugliness of sin and the human condition. And why is that? Because we can't, there's an inescapable fact that we have executed our creator, and not only our creator, but our redeemer. There's just something horrific and ugly about that. But on the flip side, we also have the revelation of the profound. I just want to point out, he said creator and redeemer. Did you guys notice that? That he's both? If you think back to our first class with creation, how Jesus as the word was present at creation, Right? And so we think of God the Father as being the creator, um, but Jesus, that the word was spoken. God said, that, let there be light, and there was light. So he created as well. But he's also a redeemer in that he did this for us. Okay? How do God's love for us? Because what kind of God do we have who would descend and empty himself out so completely in such humility and poverty to express and articulate to us the profound depth of his love. So we've got two sides here. We've got, on the one hand, the ugliness of sin, and then we've got the, the glory and the love of God being revealed. Let's talk about that first side, the ugliness of sin. Tell me more about the, uh, the condition of humanity under sin. Well, you know, in the beginning, when God created us, um, we lived in perfect union and friendship with God. And through the sin of disobedience and the abuse of our freedom, we introduced into the human family all sorts of disorders that manifest themselves in very, very horrendous ways through violence, through lying and stealing and cheating, betrayal, and all sorts of things. So, uh, the problem that we face historically is that despite our very best efforts to try to fix that problem, we're not capable of doing it. It's impossible for us. And why is that? Because we can't give to ourselves what we don't possess. We don't have integrity, and so we can't bestow it on ourselves. And this is where I think the crucifixion of Jesus really becomes so critical to our understanding of our faith. Because what we recognize in that is that God himself has taken it upon himself to restore us to that integrity. Well, how does it solve the problem of sin, though? Does it make God become a man and die on the cross for our sin? If we think of it this way, sin entered into the world through disobedience, but disobedience of Adam, and the refusal of Adam to give himself completely to God. Whereas by contrast, here we have Jesus, who through perfect obedience, gives himself completely in love to the Father. So what we have is a contrast between the disobedience of Adam and the obedience of Christ. I mean, a lot of people today have an understanding of the cross is all about Jesus is taking on punishment taking on the wrath of the Father, the punishment that should have been inflicted upon humanity. The Father instead throws upon the Son and freely accepts his punishment on our behalf. But others may wonder, that just seems unfair. That just uh, seems uh, like a, as if there were a dad who had a son who did something wrong and was going to punish the Son. Imagine if the, another son came in and said, no, Dad, punish me instead. And the Father just said, well, I just got to punish somebody, so I'll spank this innocent son. 
how does that solve the problem? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's just a, a clear example of, of our projecting onto God something that's entirely too human a way of looking at it, okay? It's too punitive in that sense. We don't have a sufficient understanding of sin, okay? So I think it's, it's a, a, better, a better way to look at this is, is that um, what we have on the cross is a sacrifice. Jesus offers himself sacrificially. He gives himself completely all the way to the very end. And he himself says during, during his life, during his ministry, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friend. So he has said, therefore, not just expressed that love, but he's performed it in this very profound and sacrificial way. So in the Catholic understanding of the cross, the focus is not on punishment, just taking on the, the wrath of God. No, it's primarily on the transformative nature of love. That love changes things, and it changes us. And this love that's, that's, that's presented to us on the cross completely renews humanity. Okay, I love that. I think he just does a good job of depicting this truth that um, the, the, love, the love of Christ um, is what bridges the gap. It's an infinite love. And it's a transformative love, and that we're getting that here in a second. So that, that kind of sets us up, okay? Um, okay, so turn with me. Anybody have any questions on what he said, first of all? You're always free to ask questions. I know I just kind of chugged right along, but you're always free to raise your hand and ask questions anytime something sounds confusing, okay? Okay, turn with me to Exodus. It's in the Old Testament, the second book of the Bible. Um, so... I am on page 102. So some background, if you're not familiar with, um, with Exodus. Okay, so the Jewish people, the Israelites, um, they were enslaved by, by the Egyptians. Okay, uh, so they were, they were um, not free. They were not free and they were living in Egypt. Uh, and they cannot free themselves. They're just, they remain in slavery until the Egyptians allow them to be free. Okay, so, so the Pharaoh um, is, you know, being pestered by Moses um, to let his people free. Okay, um, and God sends down multiple plagues to try to convince Pharaoh that these are God's people. These Israelites are God's people, um, and that, they, that he wants them to be let free. Um, Pharaoh doesn't listen, doesn't listen, takes all the plagues, okay, locusts, frogs, everything, okay, that, that's all before this, this chapter we're on now, okay. The last plague um, is, is that God will send an angel of death to wipe out the firstborn son of, of Pharaoh, and with that, every firstborn son in Egypt, okay. Uh, this is the worst of the plagues, um, and it's the final one to finally convince him. Um, and so that's the context, um, and then we end up where we're at right now. So I'm just going to do a little um, popcorn. We're going to read some of this. Uh, popcorn is like bouncing around on who's reading. Okay. Matthew, do you mind starting us off, chapter 12, and just reading, uh, reading three verses there so, um, uh, until you see the four? Sure. Thanks. <coughs> Passover instituted? Mm -hmm. Yep. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month they shall take every man a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. Okay, awesome. Uh, so they're being asked to take a lamb for each household. Okay, um, skip verse four. Um, we'll go down to five. Michelle, do you want to read uh, five and six or five through eight for us? Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from a sheep or from a goat, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation. Israel shall kill their lambs in the evening. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house. 
Okay, um, stop right there. If you can imagine. Okay, so uh, set a lamb, a year old, put it on the lintel of the doorposts. Okay, here's your door. Here's your door. It's the doorpost. Okay, um, they want the blood of the lamb. Okay, take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts. Of, of your house, okay? Put your blood here, put your blood here, of your lamb, okay? Um, okay, Isaac, can you be really loud? I want you to read verses 12 through 13. Do you see where the 12's at? Yeah. Okay. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will Keep going. The blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are. When, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall fall upon you to destroy you. When I strike the land of Egypt. Okay, awesome. Um, so the angel of death is, is going by to strike the firstborns uh, in, in every house, and he sees the blood uh, on the doorposts, and he passes by that house. You could say he, could, he passes over that house, okay? And so we, we call this, um, this event Passover, all right, for, for this reason, that the, that the angel passes over this, these doorposts when you have your, your lamb uh, sacrificed and then you take the blood and put it on the doorposts, all right? This word for Passover in the Hebrew could be, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Pesha, okay? But it's, it's translated to what we uh, have, what you've been saying all whole time, as Paschal. You've been wondering what that word means when I keep saying Paschal mystery, okay? It's from Passover, Paschal, okay? It's referring to this. So, this is our foundation, okay? After, after this one time, um, the, all, the, all the Israelites put the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. Angel of death passes over them, but it kills all the other Egyptians' firstborns. Okay? So they are saved by what? By the blood of the lamb. By the blood of the lamb. We're getting there, Karen. Don't, don't, don't jump to the, the end yet. Okay? All right, so um, death was never a part of God's plan, okay, for the for the um, Egyptians um, or for us, okay. But as a consequence of disobedience, it comes about. So we're not supposed to die. Uh, Adam and Eve weren't supposed to die, um, but as as a consequence of our sins, it comes about, um, and not only physical death. But spiritual death uh, in the end, okay, if we're holy disobedience. Um, and so it's from our disobedience that it comes about. And so in order to conquer it, we go back to the Old Testament. Because after this moment, the Israelites celebrate this uh, event of Passover every year. You guys have heard of Passover for Jews, probably, right? Jews celebrate Passover still. Um, and they're celebrating this. They have Passover meal where they slaughter a lamb uh, and they have to do it different ways than what they used to, right? But they still have, have lamb meat, okay? So uh, this is the book of Exodus. Exodus meaning, um, you know, exiting. That the Israelites are exiting from Egypt, from their slavery. So not only are they saved from the um, slaughtering of the firstborn sons, but they're saved eventually from this, this scene from their slavery. From their slavery in Egypt, Okay, but they're, they're set free at this moment, and they, although Pharaoh pursues them, that they're, they're made free by, uh, by God's okay, miraculous works. Um, okay, so let's skip ahead here to the New Testament. So if we had more time, we could go into this 
in way more depth, and we will a little bit when you do the Eucharist class. Okay. Um, skip ahead here to 1 Corinthians. Okay, it's one of the letters of Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Sorry, chapter 5. Split back if you're on 15. It's on page 1477. If you're looking for it. 1477. Stephanie, can you read us 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7? Just one verse. Oh, there it is. Paul's telling us what's up. Okay? Cleanse out this old dough, this, this old way of life, this, this gap we have between us and God, and bear the Paschal Lamb, lamb that, the Passover Lamb, Lamb by, by which blood we are saved, because Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. So I was talking about earlier with liturgy of the Eucharist, how we celebrate a sacrifice. We have a sacrifice at Mass uh, in that we are offering the word that's made flesh. Okay? We're, we're going back to Passover as in at, at Exodus when they, offered, when they slaughtered a lamb and put the blood on their doorpost to be saved. And we're offering our Paschal lamb, Jesus Christ. We're not offering him again. We're going back to that same sacrifice on the cross, okay? Same, same sacrifice that saved us in the beginning. Saved us not in the beginning, but at his death. Okay, so, I want to go over here. Oh, by the way, um, the one line Michelle read from Exodus about the lamb being, uh, um, you know, one year old and unblemished, okay? This is why we had to have Christ unblemished perfect. He's God. Right? Um, the unblemished lamb. That's the, only, that's the only one that can die for us. So I want to go, over, go into now um, those three days I mentioned in the beginning. The three days that are the end of the Gospels in, uh, in the Catholic Church. We, we call them the Triduum. Kevin will do a class on this later on for the uh, calendar uh, for the church year. We call it the Triduum, the, the three days. Okay? And so three days are Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then Holy Saturday. Okay. Um, if we go back to Matthew. I want you guys to see all this. We'll read a little bit of it as we have time. Matthew 26, so again, it's beginning of the New Testament, first gold. My, my idea here is that you're getting good at flipping through the Bible, okay, and understanding where, where things are at. If you're not sure where it's at, it's page 1304, or 1303, so you can turn 1304. Okay, so Matthew 26 would be like Holy Thursday. A lot of things happen. We have um, the, the Jews, Jewish leaders seeking out Jesus. We have the Passover with the disciples that he celebrates with his disciples. The Passover meal, he's Jew. And we call it the Last Supper. Then we have Jesus go out to Gethsemane after, after dinner. Gethsemane is a garden, okay, that's, that's in Jerusalem. We're going to read through that here, okay? So by this point, Jesus is God. He knows what's going on. Jesus knows everything. Um, he knows what's going on from the beginning, but as he's going through his meal, it's on his mind that this has to happen. Or sorry, I erased the cross. That the cross has to happen. Okay. Um, so let's see where we were at. Joe, can you read for us um, verse 36? 
Jesus prays in Gethsemane. Just didn't start reading there. We can, we can switch. Uh, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. Father, if it is possible, let this chalice pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Okay, stop right there. Um, okay, so my father, okay, who's he talking to? God the Father, the unbegotten one, the one we offer the Mass to, okay, because he's the Son, remember that? So he's speaking to God the Father, and he's fully human, and so he's kind of in agony, doesn't want to go to this uh, death that he sees coming. In our, our video, he said, compared to the electric chair, okay, so remember, a guy, you can just imagine a guy on death row, knowing what's coming, um, in kind of agony of, of going towards this death that he knows he can't avoid, okay? Let this chalice pass from me, okay? This is going to be hard, well, let it pass from me, if it be your will. But only as you will. See, Stacy, can you keep reading? And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, the second time he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Okay, just to emphasize again, your will be done. Okay, remember he talked about the obedience in the video, how Adam was disobedient, but Jesus was the obedient son, the obedient son. And so he doesn't want to, but as you will, not as I will, as you will, the obedient son. Um, who's sitting next to Andrew? Oh, William, you don't have a Bible, do you? Andrew, can you keep reading? So I think we're on verse 43. Yep. And again he came and found them sleeping. For their eyes were heavy. But leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to pick a scene out of Holy Thursday to pray or to, to read and pray with. Um, that was my favorite one. Um, that he's asking disciples to pray with him to help give, give him strength. You probably ask your friends to pray for you when you know like things are coming that you don't want to take on, right? That, um, that you're not, it's going to be a challenge. And so pray with me, please. Pray for me. Um, and his disciples, what do they do? They fall asleep. So even in his, in his most difficult moment here, we see the sinful nature of humanity, right? Uh, of not being there for the Lord, not, not obeying God. Okay, so he's um, betrayed by Judas, who's one of his 12 apostles, uh, his 12 closest friends. He's betrayed and handed over to the Jewish authorities who are seeking him out to kill him. Um, and he's put into prison for the night. Okay, turn the page, 1306. Okay, so that's Holy Thursday. Now we're on Good Friday. And right there, beginning of, of chapter 27, when morning came, okay, so this is the next morning. He's been in, in prison for the night, and morning came. Um, let me see what we're going to read here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, Pilate takes him in. Pontius Pilate is the Roman authority, not the Jewish authority, the Roman authority. Um, so he's not a Jew, but he's the one that, that takes him on to question him because the, the Jews want him to be killed, they don't have that kind of power to kill a criminal. They want it so badly, they hand it over to the Romans to do. Okay, the Romans are the, are the, um, the governing authority at that time, and the civil, governing civilization. Okay, so let's go to the death of Jesus. It's on verse 45. Let's maybe have Karen read. Do you see it, Karen? Verse 45. 
on the far right side here. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama. That's okay, you can pass it over. Whatever. That that is. Yeah, that is. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up the spirit. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, so, how many hours was Jesus on the cross? If you're an attentive reader, from the sixth hour, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour. Okay, so for three hours, we, we hold that Jesus on, was on the cross. Okay, um, on the cross meaning um, he's been put up um, and hanging there, and he's just hanging there, um, waiting to die for three hours. Okay, um, so he's calling out to to the Father. He's actually quoting from, a, from the Psalms. This is Psalm 22. You can look it up later, okay, when you go home and you're, like, viewing this class and getting excited. Um, and he gives up his spirit. But notice, again, humanity doesn't come through. They're mocking him. He's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah comes, okay? It just, we just, like, it keeps getting pounded into us. The, sin, the sinful nature, you mentioned the, the ugly nature of humanity, keeps coming through. And then the glory of God. We have these two themes that are over and over again in Paschal Mysteries, okay? The ugly nature of, hum of, of human sin, human sin of humanity and then the glory of God. Okay, um, Don, can you keep reading there? For verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were uh, also were opened and many bodies of the saints who Let's stop there. Okay, so that's a confusing part for people. I want to go into this anyway. Um, so the temple was the place where, where Jews worshipped in Jerusalem, um, God's house. And there was the Holy of Holies uh, that was in the center or the back of the temple that only the high priest could enter once a year. And so that was where God, God dwelt. The curtain, when Jesus died, was torn in two top to bottom, so that it was revealed to all. Highly symbolic. If you remember in our church, if you remember the tabernacle, what's the tabernacle? Somebody tell me what the tabernacle is. Oh boy. Someone remember? Brooklyn's got it? Tell me, Brooklyn. Where the body of Christ is at. Right, where Jesus is at. Good job. Okay, the Eucharist. The fancy word, the Eucharist, it's reserved in the tabernacle. It's the, the big gold cylinder in the, in the far back of the church. Um, and the, the, the doors on our tabernacle at Magdalen look like curtains. They're kind of flowy, if you remember. You can go back and look at it sometime later. They're kind of flowy. And when we open that up, it's the curtain being torn in two, and we have access to God himself. Okay, and so this crucif the, the death of, of Jesus allows all humanity to access God. So when we pray at the beginning of every class, we are coming into access with God, communing with our Creator. We didn't trust Him before that, to do that. We were, had original sin in our soul, right? Uh, we were forever damned. No, with the death of Jesus, everything changes. Uh, and so it's opened up, and we actually say that, um, so the gap... The gap that was between God and man, okay, this is, um, this was true after death as well. Um, and so all those who died before Jesus could not be with God. There was no heaven and hell before, before Jesus died. There was, at least there was no heaven that was open to humanity, okay. There was just the realm of the dead. They were just all kind of waiting. And so we hear this line about the tombs being opened after, the, after um, Jesus died on the cross, those who were dead, who had already died before Jesus, or before Jesus came around into the picture, had the opportunity to choose Christ or not choose Christ. 
That's actually Holy Saturday. We're skipping ahead a little bit here. Okay, Jesus died on Good Friday. Okay. That's, that was... It, it was good in that it was for our salvation, but it wasn't pretty. Okay. Um, and at the moment that he died, the curtains t- torn in two, and heaven is opened up so that when people died, now we can be with God because Jesus died. So he closed that gap. Remember the, the little illustration. Okay. Before that, mankind could not be with God in heaven. There was, that was not an option. But at this moment, everything changes. The earth shook. Okay. Um, and in, in the creed, which is a prayer we say, I think this is off, or it's like I had it on the computer. Yeah. Um, the creed that we say at Mass at the end of the Liturgy of the Word, um, actually, no, it's the Apostles' Creed. It's not the Nicene. It's a smaller creed, which is, I looked it up, it's in your, it's in your little prayer book page 10 of your prayer book, okay, the Apostles' Creed, um, and there's a line in there that everybody gets confused by, it says he descended into hell, okay, Jesus um, suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, he descended into hell. It's referring to this part about going down to those who had died already, um, and giving them the option to choose Christ or not choose Christ, okay, they can choose what he's done is their salvation, or they can reject him like Adam and Eve did, and go to hell. Okay? Um, so he sent it into the dead, would be a better translation of that. He sent it into the dead. Okay. And then we go to Matthew 28. Okay, page 1308. So we'll put the page there. So this was the sent into hell. Sent into the dead, we could say. We have one, two, next day is Easter, and that's the third day. So on the third day, we have this scene, Matthew 28, where are we at here? Amber, do you want to read for us? Matthew 28, right at the beginning there, which is the resurrection of Jesus. Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went into the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lives. Okay, stop right there. That's one of the most glorious lines in all of Scripture. Um, I, I've, I've visited the site in Jerusalem where, um, where Jesus was crucified and then uh, where he was buried too. And that's the most powerful uh, thing about visiting the tomb of Jesus is that it's empty. The tomb of Jesus is empty. He is not here for he has risen, as he said. We know he died. Okay? But this is the greatest miracle of all time. That not somebody else raised him. On his own power, he was raised from the dead. He's not here, he's risen. Okay? And that's what Easter is. Um, And so, in this moment, so he opens the gates of heaven, but he also defeats death. Death was the worst consequence of our sin, uh, of, of the sin of mankind, but it has no more power when it's conquered. When there's a resurrection, when death's beaten. And so the power of death doesn't mean anything if after death we can go to heaven with God. If there's a resurrection after death. Uh, And so the Paschal Mysteries, what's so beautiful about all of these that we're going over here, is that Jesus did all these things, but we as Christians soon to be Catholic Christians. We call ourselves Christian because we live the life of Christ. And so we live the past the mysteries. Remember in, your, in the rite of acceptance, you guys had to uh, say yes, three, you had to answer three questions. And the third question was about the cross. You remember that? 
Okay, the third question was about the cross. Are you ready to take up your cross? Um, it's figurative in a lot of ways, but also we live Good Friday. And we take up our cross and, and die to ourselves, often giving our, ourselves in di different ways throughout our life. Where we have to say no to our own desires, our own selfish desires, okay, uh, for others, for the Lord. You said no to some things to be here at RCIA. You made a sacrifice in that. And that's a, that's a little death that you're doing, living Good Friday, okay? Um, and, then, and then we live our Easter, okay, in that we um, can rise from this death, and this is what baptism is, which we'll have a class on baptism later on, okay, where you can learn all of this more intently and more deeply. Baptism, though, is meant that you go down into the water, you die in the water, and you arise out of the water um, in the resurrection, and you live with Christ, Okay, um, and then the last part of the, the Paschal Mysteries is fifty days later. So not, it's not in sequence. Fifty days later, okay. We have what we call the Ascension. Jesus, he he resurrects. Okay, he rises from the dead. But he's, he's on earth for a while still in a, in a risen body. But at the ascension, 50 days later, he goes to heaven. He goes to his rightful home. And so again, we live the life of Christ. So when we die and rise, we eventually ascend, not on our own power like Jesus, but in his, on his power, we ascend into heaven. Because his human nature, he brings his human nature with him to share fully in his divine glory, right? He's still fully God and fully man. He doesn't change, uh, you know, persons. He's still Jesus Christ, the incarnation, but now his human nature is able to share in all of this as he, as he died in his human nature. So his human nature is able to experience, experience heaven, um, and that sets it up for us to do the same, to also have that. And at every Mass, liturgy of the Eucharist, we celebrate that. That this whole, this whole three days is made present to us all at once, as the priest says that Eucharistic prayer, and we and we see it happening. The priest, when he celebrates Mass, has to, has to look at a doesn't have to should look at a crucifix to remember what he's doing. They celebrate in, uh, this mystery, the Paschal mystery. Okay, um, and so every Mass we go to, we we are taking part in this, and we're offering ourselves with Jesus uh, in that. Um, and so, yeah. I want to pray a prayer. Um, I have one more video to show you, but I'll send it to you because we don't have time. Um, Mark, Kevin, Mikey, help me out. Just pass these out. Oh, yeah, I should have my mask on. We were praying this prayer all throughout the pandemic, or all throughout the shutdown, because uh, no one could go to Mass, and so they weren't able to receive the Eucharist, which, which is central to our faith. So we were able to make a spiritual communion, but actually, this prayer is open to anybody to pray. And for you as non-Catholics seeking the, seeking the Church, it's absolutely perfect, okay? Um, because you've expressed the belief that the Catholic Church teaches um, and in that belief, you've sought out the grace that, that is offered in that, in the Paschal Mystery. Um, and so this prayer is expressing that and asking Jesus to give us that grace, meaning his life, um, that he gives in the Eucharist, that he gives in the Paschal Mystery, to us, even though we can't receive him physically in the Eucharist. Okay? Um, so add it to your arsenal. Let's pray together. Um, then we'll flip into groups, maybe discuss this for a little bit. Uh, if anything struck you today or whatnot. So let's just pray together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there. Unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go back to our groups. Uh, mask on in your chairs. And we have a few minutes of discussion. Um, and then, you know, after five minutes of discussion, you're free to go. Just whatever struck you, just whatever you want to talk about. 